seen but if um if you are worried about that then the best thing to do would be to switch your camera off now uh, to avoid uh, any issues but it, it shouldn't be a problem and the reason why we record them i should say is that the linen hall library has a very successful youtube channel and we like to post all of our uh, all of our talks and events on our youtube channel so please do uh, go on to our YouTube channel and, and subscribe to it, and then you'll be notified with it, with everything that we that we upload there. So I'm just slightly distracted there because there was a couple more people just came through, and I had to just admit them into the the session. So tonight's speakers are Noel McLaughlin and Joanna Branoff, uh, and they are the author, authors of the the wonderfully titled "It Has to Be Said: How Belfast Got the Blues: A Cultural History of Popular Music in the 1960s." Noel McLaughlin is a popular musician, historian, and a senior lecturer in the Department of Arts uh, at Northumbria University. Uh, and his colleague, Joanna Braniff, uh, is an independent scholar based in Belfast. She now works as a freelance author, journalist, and media consultant specializing uh, in politics, arts, and culture. And I would like to ask Joanna if she could unmute herself, and I think she's going to speak to us first and get the presentation underway. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. So our talk this evening is entitled The Politician and the Showman, History, Politics and Popular Music in 1960s Northern Ireland. Regardless where you stand on Northern Ireland's constitutional status, we can all agree it doesn't exist in some disconnected parallel universe, although admittedly it can feel like that at times. Northern Ireland is part of the bigger, bigger global story and is therefore subject to the same pressures exerted by the shifting global political tectonic plates. The fractured na nature of our uneasy modern coalitions depends on the optics or how things are seen to be done and how the story is constructed. Of course, this is not a new, a new approach. Over the last century, Northern Ireland crises have come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Depending on the international zeitgeist, sometimes local drama is kept off the world stage. At other times, it attracts more widespread attention. But what is important to our story is that early rumblings of trouble are often felt by a particularly sensitive political class well in advance of their arrival. <clears throat> in politics, as in life, it's always better to be alert and to try and head off trouble before it blows up in your face. But sometimes such is the magnitude of change that local civic leaders are powerless in the face of global transition to simply opt out of the approaching tsunami. They find themselves like standing on the shore, reeling at the unseen forces beyond their control, shaping a future not of their liking. Change and its associated political crises often expose the top-down pressure being applied by Westminster. Any po policies that trouble Northern Ireland's unionist dominated status quo often reveal strained relationships with the incumbent government. Current constitutional issues around Brexit are a prime example of how these things tend to play out when it comes to Northern Ireland, both in terms of its impact at home and abroad. Unionist policy is always to be entirely British, except when it suits them not to be. And that's part of the reason why Northern Ireland is not the same as Surrey, Gwent, Aberdeenshire, a normal part of the UK. It has been and continues to be a place apart. Um, I think my colleague is still on mute there, so I, I'm going to pick up where, where he was to start. When Labour, led by Harold Wilson, came to power in 1964, a quieter, slower, behind-the-scenes political crisis began to brew. The attitude at the top of the British state and those holding the purse strings suddenly changed, and not in a way that was favourable to the ruling Ulster Unionists. 
the blind eye that had been turned by successive conservative governments as to what was happening in Northern Ireland was opened and firmly trained on social inequality and poor economic performance. With the conservative election defeat, the cosy relationship the unionists had enjoyed with the British state since the end of World War II was suddenly over. The newly elected Prime Minister, Terence O'Neill, found himself as the first Ulster Unionist leader without the unquestioning support of the British government. Wilson himself was ideologically in favour of Irish reunification, which caused huge disquiet in Unionist ranks. Labour's young firebrand revolutionaries on the left were gunning for O'Neill and demanding long overdue social reforms in Northern Ireland to address systemic discrimination against Catholics. Unfortunately for O'Neill, the political spotlight's luminosity was being amplified by increasing global access to communications technologies such as television. Newspapers then had to compete with the fast paced immediacy of the rival medium. So any previous deference to politicians was abandoned <clears throat> in favor of critically reporting on sales attracting scandals or government failures. Ample material for both was being generated on a daily basis in Northern Ireland as the 1960s progressed, much to the embarrassment and annoyance of the recently installed Labour government, which had committed itself to such reforms in its pre-election manifestos. Hitherto, newspapers in both Britain and Northern Ireland in the private ownership of prominent party supporters had virtually ignored such breakdowns in relationships between the North's unionists and the government of the day. When it came to Northern Ireland matters arising, there was an unofficial paper wall in existence, which was about to be torn asunder by changing global politics. With Labour coming to power, both the subvention, that is the British government's annual financial subsidy to Northern Ireland, and the convention, that is the British government neither legislated nor debated devolved matters in Westminster, both risked being hung out to dry like dirty laundry for all the world to see. In Wilson's New Britain, what was happening in Northern Ireland was even more of an embarrassment on quite a few fronts. To address this and hopefully bring Ulster in the line with any modern civilized Western European democracy, several pragmatic goals would have to be achieved. Overturning the region's poor economic performance and ending long-standing discrimination against Catholics in politics, jobs and housing. These drives for rapid reform were pushing the Northern Ireland state into an invidious position. A different kind of revolution was in the air and it was threatening the very existence of an insecure statelet, only just over 40 years in existence. After four decades of a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people being the acceptable state of affairs, it was no longer possible to simply close the curtains and hope that no one was watching. Northern Ireland was now under a different kind of political pressure to not only come out of the shadows of the convention via press reporting, but to present its best face to the world and announce itself as an open, inclusive, vibrant and dynamic region. Locally produced pop music could play a prominent role to help achieve the goals imposed in Stormont. It could greatly assist in putting Ulster positively on the map, both figura figuratively and literally. Because Northern Ireland was a relatively new addition to the map, it was clearly important to remind everyone that it was there, and of course, where its political loyalties lay. O'Neill's administration invested heavily in producing Ulster's official maps and ensuring that they were distributed widely to schools and other, other government buildings. As topographical propaganda, these maps were designed with a certain consistency, pointedly without displaying the Republic of Ireland, which had somehow Atlantis-like seemingly disappeared into the sea. However, they made a feature of the North's close, pro close proximity to the United Kingdom. If one examines the state's propaganda newsreels in the 1960s, maps and stormant buildings make regular star appearances. So if even the humble map could be pressed into the service of state propaganda, imagine what popular music could do to support a narrative of positive PR and economic prosperity. On-trend music is valuable for many reasons. In a business sense, it generates a lot of money for both private and public stakeholders. 
in a hearts and minds capacity that the right music can convey subtle but deeply felt legitimacy to political campaigns and causes. While the political history of Northern Ireland in the 60s is comprehensively documented, there's been little academic examination of the role of popular music and its interrelationship with the politics of the time. Consequently, the pop music of the period is often dismissed as light and temporary without significance beyond its entertainment value. While well, scholarship tells us that O'Neill preferred grand political gestures, such as inviting Taoiseach Sean Lamas to Stormont on January the 14th, 65, it hasn't recorded that them entered the top 40 of the charts with Bibby Please Don't Go just two days before these particular optics of appeasement to the British government was staged. In short, scholars have generally ignored music's cultural capital in the new Ulster propaganda of the time. If it's easy to miss what was happening front of house with regard to pop music, then naturally backstage activities have been neatly kept out of view. But a discreet unofficial quango is actually central to the dynamics of the local pop politics relationship at the time. The other primary way the 1960s is remembered is through the retrospective accounts of the popular music heritage industry, so-called. At the center of this is the legend of them at the Maritime. According to the display in the OES Center, which drew sustenance from the numerous pre-existing biographies of Van Morrison, this is the great moment when Belfast, Northern Ireland, and indeed the rest of Ireland got the blues and was suddenly transformed into an island replete with popular musical creativity and furthermore, of the credible and original variety. It is central, central to our argument that music is much more than the mere soundtrack to Northern Ireland's 60s, or reducible to an important apolitical avenue to celebrate for its role in putting the region, in that hackneyed phrase, on the map. Simply put, the heritage narrative insists that everyone was having a great time, whilst the scholarly political histories call out increasing divisions and social and political failings. In a modern context, of course, it's much easier to sell an uncomplicated apolitical story of a city's music heritage to tourists and folk at home than explore why and how the narrative starts at this precise moment. In its telling and reselling of the story, music and its relationship to politics has been conveniently disconnected. So what was actually happening? back in 1964, the year after Captain O'Neill became the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland at the start of the countercultural revolution. Well, given his austere and reserved personality, O'Neill seems like a man out of step of the times. However, history reveals that he was more switched on and tuned in than perhaps he's given credit for. As the more considered political historians form us, O'Neill, despite his patrician air, was a huge admirer of America's youngest elected president, John F. Kennedy. He was inspired by Kennedy's energy, speeches, and stagecraft. And while the two men appeared to inhabit different generations and different politics, just three years separated them in age. Even as finance minister, O'Neill was undoubtedly taking notes on how the charismatic Kennedy was deploying show business tactics in his campaigns to win hearts and minds to his controversial policies. O'Neill was intelligent enough to see the parallels in his jurisdiction and would have been watching from the sidelines with interest. The 1960 US presidential election is the first modern political campaign race when the focus switched from manifesto content to the leading candidate's image. It was also the first to use television as the new medium of political communications as at this point, the majority of the American population now had access to TV. This suited Kennedy's relaxed, inspirational, modern style, and it was the perfect platform to, to deploy showbiz glamour to attract attention. Music and movie star Frank Sinatra was commandeered as the figurehead for Kennedy's all singing, all dancing campaign. Sinatra even recorded a specially adapted version of his hit, High Hopes. And while it's not unusual in a more contemporary context to see pop stars and politicians cozying up to each other, think Britpop, 
Back then, this cross-pollination of worlds was unusual and novel. Many voters may not have liked Kennedy or his anti-racism policies, but Sinatra was hugely popular and the halo effect of his celebrity magnified and strengthened the young would-be president's appeal. Pop in the service of politics was not custom and practice in the UK, however. The significant exception was in World War II when music stars were enlisted to keep morale high. But the United States pre-Kennedy also importantly had its jazz ambassadors beginning its first tour in 1956 the US government hired leading musicians, notably Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie, to counter anti-American propaganda. The Soviet press was gleefully highlighting America's hypocrisy in presenting itself as the liberal and benevolent leader of the free world, when it was at the same time less than progressive in its response to the burgeoning campaign for civil rights. The intensive state-funded initiative was a hugely significant counter-propaganda operation. It deployed popular music via its most celebrated African-American exponents to promote multiculturalism, deflect away from racism, which was totally at odds, of course, with the harsh reality of life in the Southern states. When JFK assumed office, he knew he needed something similar, a popular sweetener to break endemic racial discrimination and bring the nation together in harmony and economic prosperity and to turn away from segregation. Maybe here, one is beginning to sense a parallel between the US and Northern Ireland and why O'Neill would have more than a mere passing interest in this strategy. The Kennedy Sinatra alliance is novel in another way. It was not in the national interest. Instead, the explicit goal was getting a young liberal senator of Irish ancestry elected to the White House. High hopes was therefore attuned to effect change in certain quarters of society, not to mollify an entire nation caught in a domestic crisis. It was nudging rather than patriotically stirring. In the UK, music and popular performers were not publicly supporting party political positions. In the days before Oasis and New Labour, mixing entertainment and politics was regarded as trivialising of the seriousness of the democratic process. However, such British coyness melted in April 1964 when, as then leader of the opposition, Wilson appeared with the Beatles at the televised Royal Variety Club Awards. He was, of course, the Beatles parliamentary representative with his, in his constituency of Houghton and Liverpool, possessing one of the highest concentrations of people of Irish descent in England. Indeed, Wilson would all, often quip with his friends in the Doyle that they had more Irish constituents, constituents than many Dublin politicians. The importance of the Beatles to the politics of the time has other facets. Earlier that year, the group achieved the seemingly impossible, breaking the US market and kickstarting the so-called British invasion movement. The Beatles' new way of doing business and their phenomenal success had considerable influence over the culture of the 60s, as we know. However, the most important aspect of this halo effect was when it was forthrightly extended into the usually sedate and conservative world of politics. The pivotal event was when the group's endorsement of Labour and Wilson played an important role in helping the party win the 1964 general election later that year, thus ending 13 years of Tory rule. The Beatles breaking of the US market was akin to striking a new oil reserve for the British economy but they also embodied desirable representational qualities for this new Labour-led Britain. They became the literal poster boys for regional dynamism, democratisation, youthful aspiration. With their cheeky but intelligent working class do-it-yourself ethic, I mean, it was novel first off that they wrote and performed their own songs. The Beatles gleefully overturned the old guard's rules and embodied a changing, energised Britain. This was figured formally in both look and performance. As there was no lead singer, no orthodox focal point, the group broke with the long-standing practice, the reigning template of the time of singer plus back in band, as in Cliff Richard and The Shadows. Against custom and practice, the Beatles were a collective, an aspect heavily noted and indeed widely promoted at the time. They embodied 
the right image that Wilson wanted to project onto the international stage. As a marker of this, the group was mentioned more times in the Westminster Hansard of 1964 than Northern Ireland was in the first five years of the decade. So the experiment of popular music could be used to highlight political agendas and attract people of voting age had now been tried, tested and proved successful by both Kennedy and Wilson. While it was clearly a strategy that worked, it was also a very risky one. The youthful JFK and the avuncular Wilson were both confident enough and in possession of big enough personalities to ensure that they would not be overshadowed by their celebrity supporters. With the international template already set, why wouldn't the Northern Ireland state be interested in what locally produced pop music could do for it? But if tempted by the star-spangled pop politics propaganda exercise, the naturally conservative Stormont would need to step carefully into this potentially volatile yet effective exercise. The scent of the 1963 Profumo affair still lingered in the air as a warning of what could happen when pop and politics got too close. That scandal had ultimately cost Macmillan his leadership and also contributed to the conservative election defeat. Unpredictable popular culture was akin to catching lightning in a bottle, potent yet potentially dangerous. Therefore, it needed arm's length expert handling to minimize any political fallout from the inevitable explosion. But desperate times often call for desperate measures. Political histories acknowledge that O'Neill was not above appropriating other people's good ideas, especially after they'd proved effective and appealing. O'Neill had shamelessly pilfered the Northern Ireland Labour Party's technocratic modernising clothes, even purloining its new Ulster epithet for his own ends. But perhaps the ac accusation of intellectual theft is unfair to O'Neill when it comes to mobilising music for political ends. O'Neill was publicly checking the Beatles well in advance of Wilson even being elected as Prime Minister. The Ulster Unionist leader, no doubt inspired by the success of the Kennedy-Sinatra relationship, was already looking to the star power of the Beatles. O'Neill was referencing the group in speeches to the party faithful, even before they became a wholly international phenomenon, and he would continue to do so with increasing regularity and media prominence throughout late 63 and into 1964. The first of these references to the Beatles featured in local press coverage in late 63, two months before the Fab Four secured their first US number one and ahead of their famous 1964 arrival in America. This raises two points of interest. First, while O'Neill may have been well informed about these not yet fully consolidated pop music trends and their attendant politics, it is doubtful he could read the inner cues of what popular music of the likes of the Beatles meant let alone what that could do for him. Secondly, sensing that calls for change were imminent, O'Neill was concerned about future voters and the renewal of the Unionist Party. The times indeed were a-changing and the captain knew it, but the real issue was what to do about it. His uncharacteristic invocation of the Beatles had two functions in the context of the turn of 63 into 64. The first is the problem of modernizing the Ulster Unionist Party and overcoming the fact that young unionists going against the thrust of the 60s were old in outlook and attitude. O'Neill was already alive to the coming changes even before Labour assumed office. He was undoubtedly aware that through the new Irish diasporic dynamics in the White House that Kennedy would begin to push for change and for a number of very good reasons. And even if the border and sovereignty were not, were not yet openly on the, the agenda, there was building pressure to counteract Northern Ireland's poor rep reputation with respect to, to the unequal treatment of almost half the population who were not unionist voters and bring Catholics on board for the survival of the union. O'Neill needed a strategy commensurate with the times to quickly transform his old fashioned insular, defensive, even isolationist party into an organization with appeal to the next generation of voters, many of whom were beginning to identify with more modern internationalist, even socialist alternatives. He also had to convince his new bosses, the Labour Party, and indeed the rest of the world, that there was nothing rotten in the state of Ulster. 
Just as the US had needed its jazz ambassadors in the 50s to promote an international image of openness, inclusivity, and normality against the abject reality of what was actually happening in the Southern states, O'Neill now needed something similar. With the increased scrutiny of pro-Irish Labour MPs and potential press focuses, focus and analysis in Northern Ireland looming, O'Neill knew his favoured grand gestures might not be able to suffice as an effective distraction from actual policy and action to address these two core things, discrimination and poor economic performance. Therefore, O'Neill had to make a major adjustment. He had to take the province out of the shadows into the face of real politic and be seen at least to be embracing the new consumer driven world. He needed to accelerate the political, economic and cultural revolution in Northern Ireland and for that he needed different strategies. Cabinet meeting minutes of the period convey a sense of jeopardy involved. The statelet had to move from an isolationist, even paranoid mentality, where it was rigorously tracking what it was being said about it by other nations, to learning how to plant positive stories about the economic gains it was making in an attempt to attract inward investment from the US. And this became especially strongly felt when Labour assumed office and with the spotlight like now firmly placed on overturning economic performance and seeing evidence of reform. reform. For many in his parties and its supporters, reform meant capitulation to Catholics, and that would make only personally very unpopular. Here, the American-led businesses were important for reasons beyond mere money. In the face of the de demise of the traditional industries, American-led consortiums could be trusted to overturn partisan employment practices, giving only a necessary shield. To add to these not inconsiderable problems, he also had to contend with a new, less welcome font of power heading from the US. The incredibly well-funded and PR savvy world of the evangelical right and its desire to circumvent the ideals with which the decade is most celebrated by the liberal left. This, of course, took on a, a successful local inflection in an altogether different American-led style in the hulking form of Ian Paisley. Teen music was popular, influential and lucrative. If appropriately harnessed, it could help smooth the way for O'Neill's increasingly desperate attempts to suggest that everything was normal behind the nigh fraying net curtains placed across the Irish Sea. However, if popular music can offer good news, the first sense of a practical problem Stormont faced was the absence of on-trend homegrown stars. Quite simply, a group who could act as a localised example of the Beatles' energy and join in with the export successes of the broader British invasion movement. A local pop music scene to rival that of Liverpool and a group of brave troubadours marching off to join the ranks of the British invasion, as was their solemn duty, would be rich scenes of shiny positivity to distract from the devolved Stormont's uh, administrations, systemic inequality and economic po and failing economic policies. Clearly O'Neill couldn't go to the Beatles themselves. The group would have every reason to give Ulster Unionism in any of its guises a wide berth. This is especially so given that three quarters of the collective are of Irish ancestry. And as later events would go on to prove, the Beatles took more than a passing interest in Irish affairs, even in the 70s daring to take sides. Moreover, the group was aligned with Labour, and even if O'Neill had appropriated the local Labour Party's plans, British big groups were unlikely recruits to O'Neill's version of a good cause. But O'Neill wasn't finished with trying to pilfer from Labour, only this time it was via its informal popular musical wing. Even so, there were still obstacles to overcome. So while O'Neill needed a local beat group to spread as good news, to convey a sense of regional dynamism at home and abroad, the not insubstantial problem was the absence of just such a contender. Pop could reach the American market and thereby spread the positive message uh, to its major source of inward investment. But there were no examples of beat and R&B groups in Belfast's nighttime economy in late 63 and indeed throughout 1964 that had broken out as success, success stories beyond the region in the form of having a hit single. Nonetheless, O'Neill's Kennedy-inspired campaign would continue apace. 
swimming against the tide of expectation, he managed to purloin a little bit of the Beatles magic for his own ends. But before one gets too excited, what was secured was not the group themselves, but simply the right to use their image. In a not widely remembered PR coup, Stormont managed to combine the traditional and the modern. The Beatles image was emblazoned on a special series of Ulster linen tea towels. However beguiling this is pop culture appropriation of labour supporting pop, it begins to reveal the presence of a hidden hand. O'Neill is being advised. And while the linen tea towels would become the, the export sensation of the first half of 1964, with their presence rigorously tracked in overseas territories, it would be a mistake to assume this reveals O'Neill and the one party state newfound love of beat music. So who devised this strategy and helped secure these rights? O'Neill would need to work with a high level industry insider who understood the strategy and the market. He would lead a local team with infrastructure already in place, international connections and a track record for success. It would need to be a well-connected conduit between pop industry and politics with an investment in the development, not just of the local market, music scene, but also for Northern Ireland PLC. To tick all of these boxes, there was only one show in time, and that was the Solomon family, particularly charismatic, powerful second son, Phil. Well, Northern Ireland has a history of music industry movers and shakers. They are literally dwarfed by the power of what in our new book we refer to as Solomon Incorporated. The Belfast born and based Solomon family were majority stakeholders in DECA, the major on-trend R&B label of the time. The Stones were licensed to DECA and the label was also a major distributor of American R&B, giving them a certain cachet with, young, with the young into these cool sounds. Indeed, Phil Solomon was objectively more powerful than even Brian Epstein or Andrew Lou Goldham, the young personality managers of the Beatles and the Stones respectively. As Michael Murphy explains in his analysis of the Irish music business, the Solomons were the major in and out point between Ireland and the international music marketplace. The family was DECA's exclusive distributors for the Irish market, however insignificant this is as a, as, as a consumer territory. And more importantly, they were the major harvesters of Irish talent for ascension to the international sphere. A long deployed strategy was test driving artists in local contexts before attempting their crossover. Phil Solomon had sensational chart success before the mid sixties. He managed Ruby Murray, who still holds the record for the most songs in the UK charts at a given point. He also managed The Bachelors, a proto-Irish boy band who outsold The Beatles in 63, as well as briefly representing Tom Jones, even bequeathing the singer his stage name. In addition to major investment in many aspects of Northern Ireland's popular music infrastructure, from instruments and amplification to hi-fis and radios to higher purchase schemes through to studio recording, Phil Solomon also had related interests in film and television production and an extensive repertoire of promoting live appearances by international artists in Ireland and North and South. Crucially, the Solomon family were part of a small Jewish community in Northern Ireland. And this is not a simple fact of ethnicity. Rather, it provided them with an outsider status in regard to the either or of the usual tribal forward slash sectarian allegiances. This is evident in his brother Mervyn's more local label, Emerald. The label had a roster inconceivable in today's context as it covered the gamut from kick the pope bands to artists singing Irish rebel songs. Nonetheless, if O'Neill needed expert advisors with a track record of success, who could design and realize the ambitions of putting Northern Ireland on the pop map. The internationally connected and exceedingly powerful Solomons were the only people capable of executing such a grand plan and on an accelerated timetable. Solomon had good reason to support the one party state. He too realized that the emerging Paisleyites was bad for business in general and for the music business in particular. Only enough to think on the basis Marx's fashion of his real needs. Paisley wanted to shut down what the young secular wanted to be and do, which added to Pop's increasing attractiveness 
when it came to sort of you know, real political problems. The first giveaway sign of Solomon's involvement in Brand A&I and with O'Neill is in the legendary campaign to promote them and Van Morrison at the Maritime in April 1964. Solomon would eventually and openly manage the group in the summer of that year, but evidence suggests that he and the family were heavily involved in the band's affairs long before this point. For example, the fly posting campaign for them's Maritime debut this on the ground advanced publicity campaign is significantly missing from all of the Morrison biographies and heritage materials, but it is to the forefront of the vernacular memory of the seamsters at the time. The flyers, which were printed on bright yellow paper, simply stated, them are coming. Novel, inspirational, an example of cleverness of local PR, perhaps. I'm just going to show a picture here. Go ahead, no, and I'll share this. However, it's factually more interesting that this imaginative PR assault was less local ingenuity than a direct pastiche or plagiarism of the Beatles campaign to break into the US in January 1964. The link person here is Les Perrin a ghostly figure known to insiders at the time as press agent to the stars and often regarded as the founding father of modern pop PR. As a freelance gun for hire, Perrin worked for the Beatles and the Stones very regularly for Phil Solomon. There is more evidence of pop culture and politics though in this strategic alignment. The local press, even the newsletter, begins to include standalone features and in advance of them and the Maritime, promoting the idea of the new beat music as a viable industry, one requiring investment in order to succeed, with Solomon insiders heralded as the go-to experts that can fix any apparent problems, such as, say, substandard recording. Thus, Phil Solomon had two imperatives. The first is better known, to find a group, them, to be as Northern Ireland Rolling Stones. But this in itself doesn't make immediate sense. Solomon already had the Rolling Stones as they were licensed to the label he effectively controlled. In other words, he set to profit from the already existing group. Also, the regional beat and R&B market is already oversaturated by the time he officially begins to manage them. A sign of this in the summer of 64, the Beatles, Animals and the Kinks together occupied the number one slot at different points. There was then simply a bigger game afoot. If there was going to be a local Stones, well, what were they going to bring to the table? Would they have to go deeper? They'd need a USP. Second, any success for Solomon O'Neill is not reducible to the group themselves. Indeed, as with Epstein and Liverpool, it was about sustainability. If the Beatles became synonymous with not only kickstarting the British invasion, they are also of political importance for consolidating a distinctive Mersey sound, an earlier version of putting a region on the map via its pop music. To this end, and consolidating the standalone features that had appeared in the press, a new Northern Ireland youth magazine suddenly appeared in November 1964. City Week, with its City Beat pages, and especially the timing of its arrival, are of interest to our story. Local newspapers were in a degree of financial trouble. This is evidenced by the threat of closure of the Northern Week, whereas this novel youth and lifestyle paper, rather ostentatiously, flaunted large sections in full colour. In other words, it reveals a certain confidence and subsidisation. Second, the magazine was launched within a matter of days of the release of Baby Please Don't Go, them's first hit. This coincidence, or series of coincidences, is not exhausted yet. In January 1965, just as them entered the top 40, magazine editor John True made explicit links with what we've been excavating, and think of the key words we've been mentioning here, industry, maps, regional and economic success, and also pilfering from the Northern Ireland Labour Party. In his editorial, he said the following. Whatever you may think of their music, 
you have to give credit to local group them for putting Belfast on the pop map. With their record climbing the charts, the Belfast boys with their scruffy look may well have started a new Ulster industry, pop music for export. They might not represent the new image of Ulster that Premier O'Neill talks about, but they are succeeding in one of the most competitive fields of big business. All the signs suggest that this local brand of music could really knock Mersey Beat off its pedestal. This is just not of interest to teenagers. It can make a big contribution to the prosperity of the whole of the province. Oh, so evidently, um, shall we say, the magazine was no left field publication then. In fact, it was published by the Morton Group, responsible for the ever reliable newsletter. Not unsurprisingly, given the novel success of them, it would not only narrate the story of the group in an ongoing soap opera throughout 65, City Week would publish editorials and features supporting O'Neill and his grand plans. Timeline is vital in uncovering the connections between the showman and the politician, just as it was at the time for the informal O'Neill Solomon Quango. First, the legendary maritime night of the 17th of April 1964 exactly coincides with the announcement of the Stones debut concert in Belfast and tickets going on sale. Second, the appearance of legendary Stones a and man Dick Rowe at the maritime to vet the group synchronizes directly with the release of the Stones highly anticipated first LP. This is especially important as it synergistically linked the two groups in the local imagination. Third, them's first hit single enters the charts as La Mass is visiting Stormont. And fourthly, the hit single's role as the theme song for Ready Steady Go runs in parallel with the most high profile series of Ulster Week trade fairs in London's Oxford Street. The most revealing aspect of the Solomon O'Neill relationship and its mutual interest though is in the following. This is when and where we can glimpse overt visual evidence of a careful but intensive campaign to link the new music to brand Northern Ireland and it's not yet legendary R&B group. This image is complex. Hopefully you can all see it. This image is complex. First one can read it as a jokey affront to the state and the world of politics in a general way. Second, but more importantly, this reading is what is desired. The image is putting Northern Ireland on the map, while also signaling that the province is brimming with the same youthful energy and questioning of other regions. Despite its ambiguity, it is significant this image hasn't been featured, let alone explored in heritage materials. Whether it is an endorsement or a parody of the one party regime. In fact, it is cleverly both. It still succeeds in putting Northern Ireland on the map. One could imagine the debate between the politician and the showman at this point and how the former would need to be convinced of its appropriateness in solving his political problems. If it helps, the Stones deployed a similar image on the Mall with Buckingham Palace in the place of Stormont. Whichever way, special permission would have had to been granted to take such a picture. Against what the image works hard to convey, it is certainly not a fun, impromptu photo captured on the hoof. While the scruffy long hair seemed very far from O'Neill's new Ulster, as the image attests, surface appearances can be deceptive. Phil Solomon's vertical and horizontal business influences are best evidenced by three appearances by the Rolling Stones in Northern Ireland over an 18 month period. Their Belfast de debut concert took place in July 1964 with the expected attendant mayhem. Their last gig, their last gig ever that is, because they never played in Northern Ireland again, was an equally raddest affair in September 1965. However, the trouble created by their final Belfast engagement was not to be simply contained by lines of RUC officers holding back screaming, fainting teenagers. That's because the Stones arrived in Ireland in late 1965, accompanied by a vehemently anti-capitalist and anti-racist countercultural director 
called Peter Whitehead, tasked by their management to make a film about the band's trip. At the outset, outset this probably seemed like an on-trend and fun idea that would literally project the rest of the world, project to the rest of the world, the stones enjoying a bucolic Ireland and interacting with normal, dynamic youth, excited to be part of the capitalist aspirational drive. One of the most popular bands on the planet, skipping through a gravy technocratic New Ulster, seemed exactly the sort of a thing, sort of thing O'Neill needed as advanced global PR strategy. However, Whitehead had his very own particular agenda, and the film he made, entitled Charlie is My Darling, is exactly the sort of lightning in a bottle we warned about earlier. Whitehead was well known for his laser-like journalistic eye and his ability to embed and encode latent symbols and esoteric messages into his work. He was a true maverick and his allegiances were always to the truth of any situation as he saw it. When the opportunity presented itself to film in Ireland, this highly complex and politicized director seized it to enter Trojan horse-like as a merely a pop film director. Whitehead enigmatically noted at the time that people would see what they want to see in the film. While everyone else might have believed Whitehead was creating a jolly travelogue with Ireland as the backdrop for Jagger and Co's youthful japes, the director had ambitions to expose tensions and civil unrest being fanned by Paisley and the increasingly, the increasingly popular frontman for good old fashioned sectarianism. The charismatic reverend did not reserve his Old Testament criticism for just Catholicism. He was also firmly against any kind of ecumenicism, globalism or social reform, and of course, ungodly activities like pop music and dancing. Exactly the activities Stones, Whitehead and Solomon, and the youth of the day, and even Terence O'Neill to a certain extent wanted and needed. Whitehead firmly laid down the Holy Wars gauntlet in the film by placing a young Church of Ireland minister named Donor McNeese in full clerical garb front and centre at the Belfast Stones concert. His prominent presence in the film at first seems incongruous and playing to the stereotype of a disapproving church representative in the midst of the hedonistic pandemonium. However, a follow-up interview, which was strategically placed on the front page of the next edition of City Week, revealed McNeese's appreciation for the Rolling Stones and his enthusiasm for their music. He had been, after all, a recently retired radio DJ. The message is clear to more conservative Ulster youth, regardless of their religious designation. R&B may sound like the devil's music, but it's a godlier option than Paisley's alternative in that it allows you to still have fun. One would imagine such a concept would have delivered a positive PR boost to O'Neill and Solomon's campaign to promote a swing in New Ulster. Sadly, we'll never know, but perhaps either misjudging or completely un uh, understanding all the sen sensitivities involved, Whitehead also included in his film, variously, an opening sequence of a map of Ireland without a border, images of poverty and a lack of modernity, Sections shot separately in Dublin and Belfast, intercut as though they were the same city, and concluding with the Stones reading a copy of Life magazine's special section on the LA Watt civil rights uprising, clearly linking it to what was happening in Northern Ireland at the time. And it's worth remembering that Whitehead was doing this in the context of the British press never reporting on the long-standing civil rights abuses in Northern Ireland and the growing tensions on the streets as a result. It was also a time, thanks to the convention, that such affairs had been effectively ignored in parliamentary debate. Beyond Northern Ireland's shores, few people knew exactly what was happening. Add to this mix of Neil's paranoia about bad PR and the amount of time, effort and money he was spending to project a completely different image with his new Ulster project. And we may have an explanation as to why, within weeks of the film being finished, edited and screened once at a European festival, Charlie is My Darling effectively disappeared from public view for over 50 years. Obviously O'Neill had got his fingers burnt by unpredictable pop lightning at a time when he must have realised the situation in Northern Ireland 
was rapidly sliding out of his control. Not even the Beatles themselves could help him at this point. Again, with recourse to the timelines, one gets a sense this is when Solomon and O'Neill's informal mutual support network became strained as the tentatively balanced edifice of Belfast blue scene for export effectively fell to pieces. After Solomon's petulant withdrawal from the local scene, there would be no, no, no more UK or Irish hits for them, or in fact, there are any other uh, Northern Ireland group or singer for the rest of the decade. The relationship of convenience was further tested to breaking point when O'Neill failed to come to Solomon's aid in the pirate radio battles raging in the seas between Britain and Ireland in 66 and 67. Despite delivering exactly what O'Neill had wanted, i.e. a thriving local music scene and recording industry, a national and internationally successful on-trend youth band, concert by the most popular artists in the world, easy access to modern domestic entertainment, technology and communications tech, support for a vibrant youth magazine, and influential connections to the movers and shakers of the cultural industries, Solomon must have felt a sense of betrayal when the captain did not back his attempt to keep Radio Caroline on air when the government announced it was actively shutting it down. The incredibly popular pirate radio station was an effective tool for influencing trends and sales, as well as a serious cash cow for Solomon since he bought it for a princely sum in 1964. One gets a sense of Solomon's frustrations through his public parting shots squarely aimed at a floundering O'Neill and his empty grand political gestures. For a man who spent a lifetime, Wizard of Oz-like, carefully secreted behind the curtains, pulling the levers, Solomon opted instead for a full-on public volley from the good ship Radio Caroline with scant regard for civilian casualties. Firstly, in a high-profile move, Solomon tore up his British citizenship and obtained an Irish passport, believing himself then exempt from the British Marine Broadcasting Act. He then began a mutually beneficial relationship with the upper echelons of the Irish state, even admitting years later that he bribed Finance Minister Charles Hockey in an attempt to keep Radio Caroline afloat. Next, he announced in Billboard that a new high power transmitter on the pirate's northern ship would, quote, cover all of Ireland, making Solomon a version of the BBC's Lord Reith but with a cutlass and an eye patch. He was realizing, at least via the airwaves, Peter Whitehead and the Stones' vision of an Ireland without a border. But perhaps the least deserving casualty in this powerful men's pop political feud is the now nice, sadly neglected East Belfast born artist, David McWilliams, who Solomon signed and managed in 1967. This talented singer songwriter is often misconstrued in heritage, heritage material as Solomon's derivative Bob Dylan. But examination of the details of his lyrics and his personal politics reveals him to be so much more. As a critical commentator on Northern Ireland affairs, McWilliam did not have a place on Emerald Records' pan sectarian portfolio until his services were required by a disgruntled Phil to take pot, shot, pot shots at Ulster's social and economic failures. In his enthusiasm to lambast O'Neill's artifice of normality, Solomon literally killed McWilliams' career with overhype, spending disproportionate amounts of time and money on his promotion in Britain. The singer's association with the now antagonistic pirate uh, Radio King also meant he was effectively banned from the new Radio One playlists. So by way of conclusion, um, as as is often the way in transactional relationships of convenience, when the game changes, loyalties are quickly jettisoned in favor of expediency. That's one good reason why it's prudent to keep such dynamics out of the public eye, as any perception of spin undermines both consumer and voter trust. This is especially so with rhythm and blues. Naturally, people want authenticity. They don't want to feel manipulated by the version of reality that's being presented to them. That's why ne neither O'Neill or ever be linked to the premature birth of the first credible R&B band and the now legendary indigenous blues scene that it all apparently spawned. But whether it's contemporaneously via press reports at the time or subsequently in heritage initiatives, every story needs an author, well, most of the time. But the more skilled 
and invisible the author in PR, the more believable the story. Weave it carefully into an all encompassing myth and it transcends beautifully into unquestioned common sense, just the way things were. The truth and granular detail of this period in Northern Ireland's history is often trapped behind the opaque shattered window of the troubles that followed. Of course, it's comforting to cling to the idea of the halcyon days of Belfast in the 60s, when everybody was having a great time wearing mini skirts, singing the blues and grooving down the maritime, and life was good and no one had reason to complain, or at least that's what we've been told what was happening. But as we've outlined in this talk, there's a complicated dimension to this. To finish with a phrase borrowed from Peter Whitehead, when people look back to Northern Ireland's 60s, well, they sort of see what they want to see. Thank you very much for listening, folks. Thank you. Excellent, Nolan, Joanne. I really enjoyed that. Um, Thank you. Just first of all, to say, what, well, just to give you a wee breather there, just to mention Mr. True. We know him as Mr. True. Um, uh, you referenced there uh, in connection with, is it the Citywide magazine? Is that what it's called? City, 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 City Week. City City Week. Week. Uh, John True, he's actually a member of the Linden Hall Library and we had hoped that he was going to be on the on the session tonight because I booked the, the ticket for him. I can't see his name among the list of participants. He may well be there under someone else's name, but that was just to give Mr. True a shout out because he is uh, a supporter of the Linden Hall Library. Uh, second of all, just to say that um, you might want to just plug the book and the website and you had a couple of events coming up. So it's an opportunity maybe just to, to plug some of those if you want. Well, yes, um, uh, thank you very much. I mean, the book, of course, is um, How Belfast Got the Blues, uh, a cultural history of um, uh, popular music in the 1960s. And if, if you're suckers for punishment, we're um, speaking at Queen's uh, University um, uh, Irish Studies uh, Society on, on Monday, and then again at uh, Imagine Belfast. I'm not sure what the date is for Imagine Belfast, do you want to? Uh, that... It's going to be the, the date hasn't been exactly confirmed, but it's going to be the third, second, third week in March. Details will be up on the site probably this week. But I imagine you wouldn't want to hear us again for another hour, um, <laughs> even though the presentations will, will be different. Um, but thank you very much for, for, um, for listening to us and coming along online. Um, it's very much appreciated. We've so, only had we've only had one question coming through the chat function, um, and it was really um, to see the images again. There, there was, yes, we of saw some of them, but there was also some of them that we didn't see. The share function didn't seem to work. So, if you could just just let us see the images again, because some of them were really interesting, actually. So this is a, a flyer that appeared in the states in. Um, early, well, probably would have been the end of January, start of February in 1964. And you can see a very high profile campaign, the Beatles are coming. It wasn't just on this poster, it extended across quite a lot of the, the material for the advanced publicity for the Beatles uh, first concerts in the States as the, they were breaking America. I mean, the interesting thing about this is that the, 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 the idea of them are coming, of course, which is the appropriate um, it's not featured in any existing historical material and it's odd because they spend a great deal of time discussing the campaign to launch them and the Belfast Telegraph we could do a whole presentation on that campaign itself because again it shows the, the hand of Les Perrin but in a, the Van Morrison biographies and in um, say the oh yes enter type tellings of the story it was the trio of heroic local entrepreneurs, the three J's, um, that devised um, uh, these campaigns. Um, and it's incredibly doubtful, given the way that the world was, that knowledge of this campaign, and it being appropriated quite so quickly, because this The Beatles Are Coming was an, an America-only campaign. And we do know that its author was none other than Les Perrin, um, who, as we say, rightly is remembered as the as the founding father of modern popular musical PR. And he was an expert at remaining very firmly in the shadows and staying out of view because he understood that a good PR myth should appear authorless. It just has to, just has to appear, it has to work, it has to spread. You have to get people to talk about it. And I think we joke in the book, um, well, joke seriously in the book that 
it's, a, it's, a, it's an anomaly, isn't it? That authorship uh, law and copyright law, it's hard fought for, isn't it? To protect your rights as an author, except when it comes to PR and advertising. It's better if it's authorless, it just is. So it's just, I mean, that's an absolutely startling image for us. So these images are the cover of uh, Baby Please Don't Go. You can see one for the um, probably the American British speaking territories, the other for, I think that's Italian. These went out across the world. That might be quite difficult to see given the resolution that we have here, but that is the band with, with Van Morrison there at the front, standing in front of the gates of Stormont. Uh, in the background, you can see the Parliament buildings and the two very famous gates uh, at the front of Stormont, Stormont buildings. Um, we think, you know, uh, even, even the stance that the band are, uh, are pulling there, we think is qu quite interesting. Yes, it's, it's particularly interesting um, given um, Van Morrison's kind of latest uh, COVID songs, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, you know, Van for why COVID's a conspiracy. Um, maybe Billy Harrison, uh, them's legendary first guitarist, um, knows that's coming 50 odd years later and has decided to try and shoot him with a semi-acoustic um, before such travesties against public health can be committed. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, but I mean, it, you can see what we mean here when it looks like it's a fun impro shot that they've just Scooby-Doo like got out of the van or like the monkeys just got out of the van and set up right in front of Stormont. I mean, anybody who's worked at Stormont knows that isn't going to happen, which again is another little, all the little pieces of evidence are incredibly important here um, because it's building, it's building this sense of state cooperation. Um, and you, it, it works through absences and it works through presence and, and it works through um, um, traces. And of course, this is, yeah, this is where we um, got our cover. I think this is, this is perhaps the only um, place this photograph actually exists um, is in City Week, which is bizarrely held in um, the British Library in Euston Road in London. And um, uh, it's such an arresting picture. We were really hoping to ask editor John True if he showed up tonight, um, what um, what was going on around this. I mean, was perhaps was Phil Solomon actually present when this photograph was taken? But to put Phil Solomon's power with Decca in context, Dick Rowe was the guy that worked for worked for Phil Solomon, and Dick Rowe seemed to be in the Stone story one of the very most powerful people next to their manager, Andrew Lou Golden. Um, but Solomon could exhibit great force with the Stones. And it's another great coincidence that the Stones played three times in Belfast in 18 months, and to date have never returned to play Belfast or Northern Ireland. So it makes you again then wonder what happened. There's perhaps even another book there. One of the bands that weren't mentioned who would be a favourite of mine are The Who, and they would have been a great British band in the 60s. Were they ever in Belfast during this period? Yes, yes, they were. And they actually, um, they, all, they also suffered some, which a lot of people don't realise, some censorship themselves. And what this does seem quite farcical. We do go into this in the book, the kind of relationship between pop and state. And you'd be surprised actually how many bands fell foul of censorship. But um, yeah, The Who actually, their, their record, My Generation, was censored from, um, from Radio 1 and from kind of general play on Radio 1 because it was deemed to be uh, a, a, an affront or an insult to people who stuttered. Okay. That is the actual explanation that's given in the BBC file, that it was deemed to be offensive to people who, who had a stutter. <laughs> so, uh, and again, we also go into these great stories. I mean, everybody talks, you know, if you've ever played a game of Trivial Pursuit, you've probably been asked what was the first, maybe you're too young, but you've probably been asked what was the first record that was played on the brand new uh, um, Radio 1 station. And everybody kind of gleefully remembers it as um, The Moves, Flowers in the Rain, quite a jolly kind of poppy piece. Again, the dark side of that is the band didn't make a penny 
from that that single, even though it was the first play that went on to become a great hit, because they were actually sued by Harold Wilson for defamation and forced to hand over all monies that were made off the record um, to a charity of their choice because they engaged in a, a PR campaign that labelled the Prime Minister of the day. So there's lots of kind of interesting behind the scenes pop politics relationship that animate, um, I suppose it's a kind of push pull relationship, you know, the, 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 the politicians know how useful pop can be. And I think it's also important for us to point it out at this time, when we're, we're talking about these things, this is before any of these things ever really happened. Do you know, before people realized how dangerous being involved with pop music or being involved with rock and roll could actually be. The only thing that had really happened in Britain that would have put people off was the Perfumo affair. So, you know, while, it, while we now say a world of kind of access and pop stars and how they would need to be careful kind of management between politicians and entertainers, in those days, pe people, there was no template for it. So it was all very novel and very new. And I suppose, you know, politicians were keen at the start to see the positives that pop could deliver to them. It was only when, when, when they suddenly realized that you couldn't actually control what, what young pop singers or their managers were gonna do. They realized that what they needed to actually do then was to, to marshal them and keep them at a distance when required. I mean, I think it was one of the things that began to obsess us. What if there's, because I mean, the lens we look at pop politic relationships through now is that, well, God, have they sold, enough, have they sold out? And you know, we love a good story like Gordon Brown not being able to name a single Arctic monkey, monkey song after he's claimed that he likes the Arctic monkeys or, you know, or the, the embarrassment of Blair and Creation Records and Alan McGee and Oasis and all cozying up to each other as part of the New Labour kind of campaign. And, and it's always the debate of selling in and selling out and the, you know, and the, the absurdity of the appropriation in question. And we thought, well, it's very interesting looking at the way that it worked in um, in Northern Ireland because it, you know, appropriating them or developing a band that can act as a kind of poster boy for normality and good news isn't all negative because it gives everyone a focal point for something to actually believe in beyond. And so, but it's also a way instrumentally for O'Neill and Sullivan to both achieve mutually um, supporting aims to start growing a scene, to start doing positive PR, and the, all the behind the scenes new bless oblige that, that goes with that. But when Solomon withdraws, the game's over in terms of hits. And it's very, very odd, because Baby Please Don't Go, um, you know, them second highest chart position, but first hit. It's released initially in early November of 64, and it gets a, has a TV appearance or two, but it's, it, it, it stiffs as a record until the beginning of January. And there's an issue here that we can't prove, but it's interesting that is the record willfully held back? Because Solomon's got the power to buy music into the charts, but he saves it for um, it becoming the theme tune of Ready Steady Go, the most edgy program. And it's on that for eight weeks. And that's played carefully to coincide with the mass arriving at Stormont, which is, you know, RTE rightly described as one of the significant political moments of the 1960s, because it, you know, suggests a new rapprochement between the two states and possibly the idea that Northern Ireland's being recognized and as legitimate by, you know, more moderate nationalists and so on. It's a, it's a pivotal moment. And it's interesting comparing all the timelines of when events, the, the event, some events coincide, coincide to the day. And obviously for the sake of brevity, we could have gone on and given you more and more evidence as we went through the 60s. But it was just to give a teaser of some of the, the things, the swapping of campaigns and the, the, the playing around. There's a very big game of foot that pop was being used to, wouldn't be quite so dramatic as to say to, to fight for the very survival of the state, but it was there to anticipate pushbacks against certain things that might start to be aired in public. Okay, well, there doesn't appear to be anything else in the chat function. No more questions coming through. So I think that'll do us. We've slightly overshot our target of eight o'clock, um, but re really enjoyable. Um, and I hope everybody who attended enjoyed it as well. 
Um, and I hope to see some of you at some of our online events in the near future. We have our March program uh, just about to be launched within the next few days. Our April program and our May program is nailed down. So do keep an eye out on the Linen Hall Library's website uh, and we hope to see some of you at our future online events. So if that's everything, I'll bring the session to a close and just to say thanks again to everybody else for coming out this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, say, thank you very much for everybody for, for joining this evening. We, we really hope you enjoyed our talk. We want to thank the Linen Hall Library um, because again, you know, we really need to make the point it's resources like the Linen Hall Library and like the Newspaper Library and like PRONI that allow projects to actually happen. It was only by having such amazing resources and such amazing, amazing staff to help us that we were able to piece through all the stories that we were able to trace with some great Rick Warren reads. And that's why it's really, really important that we always defend the services that are provided by places like the Linen Hall Library. So we want to really thank them, not only for allowing us to give this talk, but providing great resources. The, the kind of the first draft of history is in behind those walls. And that's where you need to go to to find these stories. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.